Hello, and welcome to the Nursing Economics Podcast Series. This series provides extended content relating to articles published in the journal, such as interviews and roundtable discussions. Before we get started, we have a special offer for our listeners. You can save 50% off one- and two-year subscriptions to Nursing Economics. Simply visit nurseneconomics.net, click subscribe, and enter promo code NECSAVE50 to take advantage of this special discount. In this episode, Nursing Economics Editor Dr. Donna Nikitas talks with Dr. Ken Dion, President of Sigma Theta Tau International. During their discussion, they explore the role of nurse leaders, and specifically Sigma Theta Tau members, in the effort for nurses to be informed and educated about, and to advocate for, a new healthcare economy that recognizes the impact of the global nursing workforce on cost effectiveness and savings on quality, safety, and outcomes through new care models, the use of technology, and conversation. Dr. Dion shares his vision, voice, and need for nursing visibility in the post-COVID-19 pandemic era, as well as his rationale in creating new practices and policies in the global nursing workforce. We are pleased to present this important conversation between Drs. Nikitas and Dion. So basically, let's begin by sharing with me who you are, how you've come to this position, as being installed as the 34th president of Sigma Theta Tau International. And what have been your biggest challenges as you've stepped in during this time right now? And we'll go from there. So begin by introducing yourself to our audience. Thank you for having me. Um, Dr. Ken Dion, I'm the Assistant Dean for Business Innovation and Strategic Relationships at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. And I am the president of Sigma Theta Tau International for the 2021-2023 biennium. We do live in interesting times. And I think about the times that we're in today and the times that our six founders founded Sigma Theta Tau. If you think about it, it was 100 years ago. We had just come out of World War I. Um, There were great new technologies that were invented, but at the same time, there were technologies that were very scary and quite frightening in terms of the ability to do aerial bombing and using gas and those sorts of things as part of warfare. So it was very, very uncertain times. And on the heels of that, our founders entered a global pandemic and were faced with a number of grueling years and four waves of COVID, just like we are today. And yet in the middle of all of this, they rose to the occasion at a time where nursing was needed more than it ever was and established Sigma Theta Ta as a body for codifying nursing knowledge, leadership, and scholarship. And so when I think about the challenges that I'm faced with today, um, sometimes it seems like they pale in comparison to the challenges of the founders of Sigma. But with that said, and that as a background, that was really part of the reason for the presidential call to action, or actually, and I should say, we moved from a presidential call to action to an organizational call to action because it's not about a single person. It's about the membership of the organization. And so the organizational call to action is about being bold because it really took boldness for our six founders to start this organization And 100 years later, faced with similar turbulent times, it's really up to us to be bold as an organization to help move the organization forward. And I would say, as far as challenges go, here we are coming out of a global pandemic, and we've all been separated for so long, and we miss that interaction. So I think one of the big challenges for myself and my board is to get out there and reconnect with our membership. Because it's important. I mean, one of the most important things that we all get out of our professional organizations, and let me say, being actively involved in our professional organizations, is the opportunity to network with people. I remember early days of my nursing professional journey, I had the pleasure of being mentored by Dr. Robert Piamonte of the National Student Nurses Association. And he once said to me, Ken, always remember, Connections only hurt those people who don't have them. And so for me, 
one of my biggest challenges is how do we make up two years of an organization and get out there and reconnect with our membership on a one-to-one -one basis so that they understand all the benefits of Sigma Theta Tau and all the benefits of being involved in a professional organization. So Ken, re-emphasize again the importance of the mission of Sigma in the 21st century. And when you remind us what that mission is, it does give clarity still to the underlying foundation of the importance of scholarship, leadership, and service. Absolutely. And it comes down to this. It's about empowering nurse leaders everywhere to improve healthcare everywhere. And that's what Sigma is truly all about. And we do that through a multi-pronged approach, promoting scholarship, promoting leadership, and promoting excellence in nursing practice. And we hope to do that across the globe. We support that in a variety of different ways, both with having chapters in over 100 countries around the world and 135,000 members, but we also do it through promoting scholarship for providing grants to emerging nurse scholars who are just beginning on their journey of nurse scholarship to hopefully inspire them. And it doesn't matter where in the world that they come from, you know, that small amount of money that it seems like to us sometimes in the United States is huge to a nurse researcher in an underserved country. And so that's really core to our mission is really about empowering nurses anywhere to improve healthcare everywhere. And never more important than now, during the last three years now of having come through the pandemic and still working through it as we continue vaccination and boostering the positioning of nursing, where holding the trust of those that we care for wherever they are, whether it's at the front line, in an ICU, in an emergency room, in the community, in the classroom, in the boardroom, those core values still exist. So where is the voice do you think that nursing is as it comes through the pandemic? We've been so visible across the globe, not just you know domestically, but internationally. So what are the voices that you've heard that you've had to interpret to stakeholders, both inside of nursing and outside? What's the language and logistics, the words that you use to ensure that people everywhere understand the important and access to care where they are? That's a great question. And you also gave me a really great segue to the answer to that question. Nursing adds tremendous value to healthcare systems around the world from the bench to the bedside, to the boardroom. And yet that value is so often unappreciated. Maybe not unappreciated, but maybe better said, not well understood. And that's one of the things that I've heard when I've been talking to our constituents is, you know, it's wonderful that folks think that nurses are heroes, but we're so much more than heroes and so much more than the pat on the back for doing that. And you're absolutely right. In, so many countries, and of course in the United States, nursing has been the most honored profession and the most trusted profession for the last 20 years. But unfortunately, well, let me back up from that and say that in terms of the dialogue going forward, the be bold call to action really rests on three pillars of economics, technology, and conservation. Now, people often confuse finance with economics. Finance is one component of economics, and it's an important piece. We've all heard those who have the gold make the rules, right, the golden rule. But there are so many other vehicles for economics beyond just money, right? And so if we think about the concept of value and the value of the trust that our patients put in us and that societies put in us as the most respected profession. But we have been challenged to articulate the value of the profession and what we add to healthcare systems around the world. And this is why the conversation about value-based care is so important so that nursing is part of the equation of value and not just part of the room charge. 
and us being willing to leverage that trust that's put in us by the populations that we serve. Because nursing often isn't a group that steps up and takes credit for their work, quite frankly. I remember I love Johnson & Johnson and their campaign about the unsung heroes, but we can't remain the unsung heroes of healthcare, right? And that's all about us being willing to step up as a profession and say, yes, what I do is incredibly valuable. And you know what? I'm a clinician. I'm a scientist. I'm an entrepreneur. I add value throughout the entire healthcare system, and I'm going to take credit for the value that I add. So I think moving forward, if we're going to expect a different outcome from the dialogues that we're having, then being fluent in the domains of economics, technology, and conservation are essential to changing the dialogue and moving forward nursing's agenda. I couldn't agree with you more. You do talk in your the work that you've done that we have a duty as professionals to advocate to abolish inequities within societies, the healthcare system, and even in within our profession. So how will those critical domains of economics, technology, and conservation help us to do that work, to address those inequities that you talk about? And at what level of advocacy? Great question. Well, I think first, just the idea of economics as a concept and being fluent in that concept. You know, we talk about financially underserved communities. Well, it's much more than just finance. You know, economics is really the study of decision making and how decisions are made, right? And we as a profession can have so much influence on decisions by coming armed with information and knowledge to influence those decisions about both how care is provided to the populations and how the needs of the nursing profession are met in terms of whether it be resources available to nurses or resourcing within healthcare organizations to make sure that nurses are able to practice to the full extent of their practice and to their ability, right? Or should we really be sitting around treating the electronic medical record? No, we should be treating the patient. So I think that those conversations are very important and going to have significant influence in all of the areas that we've discussed in terms of equity and inclusion. You know, when we talk about technology, again, let me just quickly touch on the advocacy piece first. Technology is wonderful. And for those folks who know me, you know, I spent a lot of my time working with technology. And there was a point in my career, I probably thought it was the silver bullet to everything. But now I know that it's not. And so, yes, there are great benefits of what we're seeing in innovations in healthcare organizations with technology and devices and those sorts of things. And, you know, what we're seeing in virtual and augmented reality and what we're going to be able to do in teaching. But every one of these new technologies has that other side of the coin. And I won't necessarily call it the dark side, but the other side of the coin where we have to be aware of the impacts of these technologies, both good and bad. You know, if you think about, let's just take virtual reality as a simple forward example most people are familiar with. You know, just recently um, in China, virtual reality was branded, you know, the next crack cocaine, you know, and stocks around the world in gaming companies plummeted that day because that society realizes that people are going to get buried in their virtual reality headsets just the way that they are in their phones so much these days. And as a profession, we're going to have to be aware of that. I mean, yes, there are great benefits. You know, we'll use it to teach young children and maybe get them interested in nursing. And we'll, at the other end of the spectrum, we'll have seniors and we'll be able to take them to see the seven wonders of the world without leaving their place of residence and, you know, break down those barriers of isolation. But at the same time, we as healthcare professionals have to be ready to deal with the addiction that's going to come along with that technology. 
And we have to be the same. And one of the ones that concerns me, two of them, and I'll just go down my tick list here, is you know, artificial intelligence. It's all around us. People do not think about how much it's already pervaded our society. Like it's something that's coming. And there are those who say that um, artificial intelligence is going to have a bigger impact than electricity did. And so it's a wonderful thing to be able to ask Siri, yes, can you give me directions to this place, right? But we also have to think that those algorithms that are the backbone of artificial intelligence are written by human beings. And the data that's collected that those algorithms work on is collected by human beings. So we have to think about the bias that could be entered into these systems, both in data collection and the development of the algorithms, because those biases are just going to potentiate themselves as that algorithm moves away from learning from humans and moves to learning on its own. So if nurses are not actively involved in the development, selection, and implementation of technologies, they could have huge impacts. And then I'll just extrapolate that into, it's wonderful that what we're accomplishing with big data research, but at the same time, we really don't think about how much energy it takes to do that. I read something the other day that said that the mining of Bitcoin is equal to the energy consumption of Finland. Oof. Right. So <clears throat> as we're thinking about how we're going to use big data and artificial intelligence to do our research, we have to use it wisely. Certainly, we have to consider the biases and everything that I just mentioned. But at the same time, and one of the things one of my mentors taught me when I was going back to get my PhD said, Ken, for years, we've taught you things. And now that you're going to get your PhD, we're going to teach you how to ask questions. And so I would suggest that when it comes to asking questions and using big data and artificial intelligence to do it, we sharpen our pencils and do our best to ask the right question the first time. Now, I know we all learn from the data as we get the answers back, but the better we can hone our questions down, taking advantage of the big data, the better it's going to be for our planet in terms of what we can conserve in energy that we can put forth to other things. And then my last point on conservation, since I've covered the triad here, yes. is just that so often when we talk about conservation these days, we're talking a lot about planetary health, something that we hear a lot about these days. But at the same time, we have to think about the human resources as well. Now, I'm not saying that we necessarily go back in time, but if we don't find a good way to redeploy our human resources who have been subject to technological unemployment, then we're going to have even big challenges on our hands when it comes to social unrest. We've all heard the saying, idle hands are the devil's workshop, right? There are opportunities for this that play into conversation. I'm old enough to remember that when my shoes wore out, I'd go get new soles on my shoes. And I went to a cobbler, a skilled tradesperson who was proud of their craft and had gone through an apprenticeship to do that. There are many opportunities for us to put people to work and value them as human beings if we take an economic approach to conservation and how we deploy our resources appropriately. So it's not just about the planet, it's about our people too. So this is a good time for us to pivot before we end. And you're in a unique position now as the president of Sigma to grab the world's attention, so to speak, when you're on this podium, much as I do as an editor. I have this pulpit, so to speak, and I try to use it in a way that is both informative, providing education, and a basis to empower my colleagues, my readership, to take the words that I've written and transform either themselves or the constituents that they work for. And now, if you take the position of being president in your own words of being bold, how do you then empower the membership, the board, the staff to work with you to overcome some of the challenges that we are reckoning with 
certainly in the United States and certainly worldwide with the notion of racial reckoning, economic reckoning, and now obviously with the stability of peace worldwide now, what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. And, and, you know, it's not that we're being political. It's because there's casualties there and, and we will be exposed to them as healthcare providers. So, so what do you say, you know, as we become humble to those that we serve who belong to our membership and to the constituencies that we serve? So that's specifically why we chose being bold. If there was ever a time for nursing to raise its voice in a unified fashion, now is it. The spotlight has been on nursing. If we do not take advantage of this point in time, we have squandered one of the largest opportunities we've ever had as a profession. And we chose those three particular pillars because each one of them is a pretty big tent. You can find a place underneath one of those pillars where you can connect with other people who share your same interest and you can have impact. And when I talk about being bold, being bold doesn't mean being brash. It doesn't mean being the loudest voice in the room. You don't have to be pejorative or confrontational, right? Being bold means being armed with knowledge and facts and being willing to use those knowledge and facts to have positive influence. So what does it really take to be bold? It takes what Sigma was founded upon. It takes love, courage, and honor. And if we can ascribe to those three principles that those six founding members of Sigma started this organization on, I think those will build the bridges that we need built. Because yes, we don't have to be at opposite ends of the spectrum. There were days where we could agree to disagree and still go down to the pub and have a beer after our big argument about whatever it was we were passionate about. And I think that's what we need to come back to. And I think if we strive to love each other, have the courage to be honest about what we need to be honest about and are honorable, because at the end of the day, you know, being honorable is a really good quality. I heard a quote recently that I loved. It was, reputation is what people say about you after you leave the room. And I think if you're an honorable person, what they'll have to say about you after you leave the room will be positive. So I think if we can re-engage with those values and not necessarily our membership, because I believe that our membership does love has courage and is honorable. But if we can share and spread those values and raise our voices together around the world, we could have massive influence as a profession. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for taking the time to speak with me today to help me understand you and appreciate your message of boldness, how you've unfolded it around the values of love, courage, and honor. And what a better way to help me appreciate the work that you've done and that you will do under your presidency. And I wish you the best. And thank you for taking time with me today to share that. Thank you, Dr. Nikitas. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. The Nursing Economics podcast series is owned and produced by Genetti Publications Incorporated. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. Dr. Kenneth Dion is the Assistant Dean for Business Innovation and Strategic Relationships at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing in Baltimore, Maryland, and President of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing. A 40-year veteran of the healthcare industry, Dr. Dion is a Virginia Henderson, Billy Brown, and Sigma Theta Tau Fellow, as well as a Pillar Society member. Dr. Dion is founder of Decision Critical Incorporated, and following its purchase by HealthStream Incorporated, he served as the company's vice president and chief of nursing informatics. He later founded TurnPath LLC, a healthcare technology innovation incubator.
Dr. Donna Nikitas is Dean and Professor, the Rutgers School of Nursing, Camden, New Jersey, and the editor of Nursing Economics. For archived episodes of this podcast and to learn more about nursing economics, visit the journal's website at nursingeconomics.net. You can also subscribe to the Nursing Economics Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, as a listener, you can save 50% off one- and two-year subscriptions to Nursing Economics. Simply visit nursingeconomics.net, click subscribe, and enter promo code NECSAVE50 to take advantage of this special discount. <laughs>